what is it that triggered that interest, you know, to, to bring music and jazz education, you know, to the community and to under-resourced and underprivileged spaces and children and schools from your early days as a professional? I attribute my, my social consciousness to my high school. I was at Livingston High School. I was there at the time when, when a lot of our teachers um, had come out of, the, out of house that used to, or went into, but it was a very politically um, active school. And so that's where my social consciousness was raised. It, it was my impetus for going into music because at the time, I really much wanted to be um, a soloist and a performer and stuff like that, but that wasn't possible for us at that time. You, you became a teacher, a nurse, or a lawyer, and that was... The career choice is open to us. So reluctantly, I went into teaching. I, I found that the, the thing that I dreaded teaching uh, became my reason for waking up um, in the morning, uh, for keeping going at a time when we, um, you know, at the height of, of the fight, we were at school for an hour and the rest were rallies, boycotts, those kinds of things and teaching it, teaching through that. So one day I said to the kids, um, at the high school where I was, I was at Heathfield High School, and there had been a walkout <coughs> stage. The kids came and said, can we play? And then we heard the neighboring school was coming down to disrupt the school. And so our school was dismissed and we didn't know that. So we kept on playing and then we heard them and they surrounded my classroom and they were shouting that we must walk out. And the kids got under the bench and so did I under the table. And I was saying to them, we're gonna be all right. We're going to be all right. And to myself, I was saying, are you mad? Um, mm. You know, these are other people's children, um, you know. And then when they left, when that school left, I said to the kids, this is going to end. And when this ends, you must be ready to take your place in the new orchestra, in the new South Africa on merit. So we're going to work towards that. But one of the students from that group, Albert Engel, he became the first person of color in the then K-Pop orchestra. And he became a first wherever he went in his career. At the time, I thought that I would never see a free country. I, mean, I thought it wouldn't happen in my generation, but it's the kind of thing that kept me going throughout post 94. Yeah. And the work looked different for a while. Um, and then the difference is that my students started becoming interested in jazz and I'm classically trained. So I took them to the National Youth Jazz Festival. And that's how I started to learn with them. And from there, I realized that jazz education needs to take as equal a place in, in music as classical education. So that's been my focus, really, to make sure that, that we give jazz education the dignity that it deserves. That is incredible. And I think people... Uh, <clears throat> will see you in you know as who you are now and and they will see you with all the accolades and you know and and the stature that you have as an academic as a practitioner and they don't actually quite have a deeper understanding of what what motivated the journey that that you've gone through and the dues that you've paid you yeah. know and the sacrifices as well right and yeah. maybe music in those communities was something was a place where kids could find safety but I wanted to move then just also on that note to um, to you, Ramon, because, no. you know, you you st what you studied you, so winemaking. I mean, exactly. <laughs> Let me just explain how I ended up there. Um, yeah. After high school, I always wanted to go and in, in, go into music and study music. But, you know, our parents, you know, um, especially my generation of parents, um, you know, you can't make a living with, with music, go get something behind your name. You know, the classic story, become a teacher or something. So yeah, eventually I did my, my four years at Stellenbosch. While at Stellenbosch, I was always busy playing music in Christian outreach bands. I met some friends and we actually started a band, you know, from all walks of Stellenbosch life at the time. Some of us were... Um, students, some of us uh, were non-music students, like 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 myself. Um, I had a terrible first year, um, and then when I came home the, after the first semester, my mom said um, she saw this advert in um, the newspaper to go um, to Grahamstown, and they've got these bursaries, which they still have, uh, apparently. And I was on a bus to Grahamstown, and while 
I was the first one there and, and waiting for, for everybody to arrive at, at DSG. Um, yeah. Then came Felicia and her, her bunch. <laughs> her group. <laughs> yeah, yeah, from, from Heathfield High. And that's how I met, met Felicia. And after I graduated, I learned that Felicia was actually at the conserve, replacing mm -hmm. um, eventually um, Al Albert Engel, who was the founder of, yeah. of, of the certificate, certificate program. program. And so our paths crossed again. And from that time, she sort of recruited me in the certificate program to teach there. The rest is history. <laughs> so talk to me, Felicia, about what is it that you felt was missing? What was the gap that you felt that the community projects, I know Mitchell's Plain, Athlone, you know, in the spaces in which you worked, what were the gaps that you felt like, um, you know, community jazz education was going to fill? You know, because obviously there were gaps. You were having on the other side of the mountain, you were having schools where there were instruments, there were music teachers, right? Everything was there. And then on the other side of the mountain, you've got communities where there are no instruments. There are no on, on the one hand, it is identifying um, and acknowledging um, the knowledge that exists already in communities and that it's not perhaps the expected kind of literacy, musical literacy that the institutions expect or that the institutions acknowledge. And, mm. and that for me was important to bring that mm. knowledge into the institution, yeah. um, admit that it's there and it has a place and it needs to be acknowledged because you know the certificate program that we have, um, uh, it, it is there to give people the skill that they need to, to read music. Um, and, and also if they're not going to study music, because we prepare them for, for undergrad study, but at Stellenbosch at the moment, um, it's changing. Um, we are introducing jazz studies at the moment, you know, incrementally and Ramon is responsible for that. But for me, it was getting those people into the, the, the music department, even in the bridging program. And even if they weren't going to study, that they at least had the tools to access a higher paying kind of gig where they could be versatile enough to go and play where they are required to read, mm. that we could increase their musical language even in that area. Mm. And the spin-off of that is that they go back and maybe they're not the ones to study, but maybe they will influence someone else to come and study. And that's what we have found happening. It's great for me to get the students of former students coming through the certificate program um, to prepare for undergrad studies where they perhaps didn't have the means to do it, but they've gone out and started projects with this aim in mind to get the students into the certificate program. But it's always at the back of my mind to, to incorporate their own innate knowledge that they come with, that we don't make them feel that what they know doesn't matter mm. because we're trying to teach them to read in a certain discipline. And we get so caught up in that, that we maybe tacitly let them feel that what they know is not important. Mm. It reminds me of an article that I, I read some time ago um, from one of these prestigious universities <coughs> in the States where it said, you know, the expectation that faculty and universities have of um, students coming in for first year, they could read and that they knew where middle C was and they had a basic understanding, you know, says that it completely negates and avoids and ignores the systemic inequalities, right? And racial inequality, right? Because it's because children of color and people of color were, are not going to arrive at a university in first year and be musically literate, not all of them, because it wasn't something that was accessible to them. So for the university system to kind of assume that everybody walks in on an equal footing is turning a blind eye to this to inequality. You know, a, a program like the certificate program seeks to recognize that. It's a powerful program to have because it's not just about the music, but as you're saying, it's about dignity. Yes. Right. That what you know is enough and what you know is important. Um, so Ramon comes in to teach uh, introductory jazz theory in this program that seeks to bridge. What are you seeing here? Are you seeing that, wow, you know, there's a big gap here. There's a lot of work to do here at the level of illiteracy. Or are you, are you seeing great talent? Um, uh, definitely um, a lack of self-esteem. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and the building itself is, is a huge actor 
in the story. Yeah, spaces. Yeah, yeah spaces are powerful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, space, I like that, Mpundu. Spaces mm. are powerful. And, and teaching music is the easiest thing that we do. The, mm. the, the other issues about once they've had a bad experience, then it's hard for them to walk in. They'll come as far as the front door and then sit on that little wall outside and maybe not come in that day. And one day leads to two days. And then you start noticing a pattern that they come here, they come from far, they come here, but they can't come in. Mm. It is still an issue. There are other issues at stake of perception and experience, um, you know, where, where, where things like racism still plays a role in getting people to, in, 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 in their self-esteem. Yes. Um, and then I thought, I thought that it wasn't an issue and still I had to speak in a colloquium on the issue. And I asked a few questions of my students who are final year diploma students and I asked them and I was shocked at what I heard. Um, and I was shocked to hear 18 years after I got here that there are still people who feel not seen. You know, and, and the reason why I say spaces are powerful is because they are, because sp spaces communicate, yes. right? Um, spaces intimidate, spaces isolate, yes. spaces exclude. <clears throat> I know, Ramon, I'm asking you to jog your memory so far back, yes. um, but you also were at the jazz workshop, right? You've spent yes. some time at the jazz workshop, which is outside of a typical sort of higher instit uh, learning institution. What was that space like? Was that space a little bit more welcoming? Was it a little bit more, um, you know, Absolutely. hospitable Absolutely. in comparison to what the bastion of institutions look like? What, what was that like? Well, it was, uh, well, I can remember that like, like it was yesterday. It was in 1998 yeah. that I was there. <laughs> yeah, Merton right. was, was my teacher and I loved him and I think he sort of loved me also and it was very accommodating and it was very a nurturing experience for, for, for me from him. You know, I, I felt that he gave his best and he tried to include me in as many activities as he could. Yeah, and I was only there for, for, for that gap year. Mm. And obviously um, I had stuff to digest for many years to come of, after I was at the workshop. I think I only started um, after I graduated with my o o onology and viticulture, started to internalize the stuff that I was taught. But I'm very grateful for, for, for that experience. And I, I teach that to, to my students, you know, and I say to them, it's not about getting the marks here. It's about really learning. You know, it's, it's about, it's about me knowing that you're going out in the world and you're going to have stuff to work on for the rest of your life. Maybe that, maybe yeah. it's, it's a case of community based education programs. See the, see the children, see the students, see them for who they are, recognize their diversity, recognize their lived experiences and they actually see them. And I want you to talk to me as well about, you know, um, how you created a safe environment when you were working in Athlone and you, when you were working at the Mitchell's Play Music Academy mm -hmm. in those spaces. How did you try and create an environment where it was not intimidating? How did you make sure that that space was welcoming to, to the kids who were part of those programs? Um, we have more, in community programs, we have more access to parents. We have, we have freer access to parents. And so getting to know families is, is a natural part of it. Those programs can't exist without parent support and without mm -hmm. parent involvement, because most of the time it's on a voluntary basis. And, you know, money is not always forthcoming. Funding is not always forthcoming. So we, you, you, get, you, you start doing fundraising events and functions. And so we get to know the larger family um, that mm -hmm. you are building up a whole child, a whole mm -hmm. person eventually. Um, not, not, not an isolated individual in front of you for that moment, for that hour, but that you are actually accountable to the family in the way you treat the person in front of you. That's amazing. And I'm reminded um, as well, just commemorating Smongile Kumalo this past week, yes. this was oh, her birthday yes. on the 24th. And, um, and the speech that she wrote, because she knew she was going to uh, get an honorary doctorate from BITS, she knew months before she passed on. And she spoke about, 
you know, her beginnings in Soweto in, in a community music program, right, that her father had established and in a center in Soweto and, you know, the music was happening in room two. And she articulates just what it meant for them as children in the township to be in room two, you know, and she says room two was the space where you know, for, for truth seeking, where kids in the township could see themselves beyond poverty and what that kind of did for the mind. And, 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 I, and I, it strikes me, you know, when you speak about, you know, the, the, the community work that you've done, that even the greatest stars of the world, once they've been through that community, you know, program where they can, where it's not about how poor they are. It's not about what they don't have. You know, they can really dream big in those spaces. Um, and I think maybe we we underestimate the value of community music projects, oh, you know, yeah. until it's late, right? Exactly. Um, I, you know, nothing highlighted that more than lockdown mm -hmm. when we couldn't see the kids because I, I managed another program in, um, in, in, in Pebbles River, the Rani Samai project um, where we bus kids in from, from townships <clears> and we couldn't for the longest time. And the first time they came back to class, it was like a joyful occasion. They couldn't wait. The, the parents sent photos back to us afterwards of them kissing their instruments as they walked in the door with their instruments. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's, we underestimated until it's gone. I mean, I want to cross kind of segue into this notion of mentorship. Right? At the jazz workshop, I can remember um, Merton was obviously um, telling me all about um, all the great piano players in the world, um, you know, about um, Chick Corea, Thelonious Monk, you know, the four cornerstone piano players. Um, he, said, he said to me, Ramon, I know you can't... Um, Go, go to America and watch uh, Thelonious or, he, you know, he's dead or, or, or Michelle Petrucciani who also died during that time, you know, but if you, if you want to see somebody that sort of embodies this, this um, jazz piano thing that I'm teaching you, go and watch Chris Schilder. And I can remember uh, while I was at university, I picked up a, a CD, you know, in Musica you have these, these um, 30 rand markdown CDs, you know, that they just want to sort of throw away, whatever. And then I picked a CD up and I, and just because it had like a piano thing on it, a picture or something, and it said Ibrahim Khalil Shihab. And I thought to myself, oh, this, my, this is interesting. You know, anyway, little did I know that this actually was Chris Schilder. 20 years later, um, be sort of mentored and sort of, you know, um, have some sort of fellowship thing going, you know. And then in 2016, I met him. In 2017, um, my manager, he said to me, there's some money available. You can make, make, make an album for yourself against us. I said, no, no, I would like to produce an album for Ibrahim. He recorded uh, an, an iconic sort of album in... 1968 with Wilson on called Spring. Mm -hmm. Post Pacific yeah. Express, there was nothing substantial. Um, I thought, you know, let's uh, let's just approach him and find out if he's got some music. You know, so so the whole process for me was like um, spiritually uplifting. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know if I helped him or helped me. Um, and in so so doing, I also, you know, um, when I look at my students, I'm so thankful for an experience like like that and an encounter uh, with a great man like that. And so, so obviously that they also know that they're part of a of a very important lineage. I mean, and and yourself, Felicia, this this notion of of mentorship. Where do you think we stand as a jazz community? Um, with, you know, in, with regards to mentorship? Do you think we, we lack it? We need more of it? We definitely need more of it. I think personal um, hands-on mentorship is all important, um, mm -hmm. especially since it has been changing from when I started in 1999, that's when I met Ramon, where there was a perception of jazz as a good time and party music mm -hmm. and you know everybody's drunk and on drugs and high and all that. And all of that is changing. 
um, with the jazz education program at UCT, though they are they are now the teachers um, in in jazz, and so they become the mentors to their students. I just want to say that my personal story about mentoring and and Ramon is he he has the kind of um, personality where students who might otherwise feel other he can work with them bring them in and bring them in and say listen i know that that's your experience but this is how you cope with it and this is what you actually have to be focusing on more than that external thing you need to focus on this and so i say to him you know i have trouble with this boy i know that he's a brilliant bassist and i want him to audition for the jazz band but then he got there and he saw there was another girl auditioning and he looked at her and decided she's good he's not going to audition and then Ramon said, leave him to me. And then five minutes later, he said, he will come and audition now. And more and more students are starting to flock to him now. And he's busy building them up from the inside to, to break down that feeling of otherness. That wall. That, yeah. wall that, that they've built yeah. up inside themselves. Yeah. So, yeah. so mm. mentorship is, oh, that is my, if I can connect someone with someone else. I, I recognize it in myself because I've been mentored and I think, well, I wouldn't be where I am had I not had mentors. Um, but the idea is not to then hog mm -hmm. it to yourself, right? The idea is to, is to pass it on. Yeah, and, and with this project I'm at, um, the, the patron of the project is the, the Mr. Rani Samai and he was my mentor, he still is. Um, mm -hmm. at, and he supported me mentally and emotionally throughout my career. Um, and I've learned so much from him. I mean, he had the opportunity to be bitter because he was excluded from, from auditioning for the Cape Town Philharmonic Orchestra those years. And he's never been bitter about it. And I've always asked him, why aren't you bitter? You know, and he kind of has a Mandela kind of personality, you know, like what is the point? And so he always builds people up and I've learned so much from him in, yeah. in that time. I really have, and I, wow. that is how I try to deal with people the way he has shown yeah. them. But I know, think so. maybe I like to, when I facilitate conversations to, 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 as we end, to kind of end on, on a note that says, what is it that needs to be done? Even if it's one thing, what is it that, you know, for myself, you know, working and lecturing at the University of Cape Town, um, I have this strong desire to, and I kind of go, well, we can't expect the community and the kids to come to the university. Yeah. How yeah. is it that we can go to them, right? How is it that we, because we've got the resources, we are funded institutions, you know, and we do have the upper hand. How is it that we can have programs that, that actually reach out to the community? And so therefore in that way, you know, we bridge this gap and that when students come in through the foundation programs to the university or they audition, first of all, before they even audition to come into an institution like UCT or Stellenbosch, they know what's expected. They're well prepared so that when when those kids come to the university, they don't walk in and see, you know, pictures of like these white European men on the walls and this European looking buildings and they walk in and they feel like they don't belong. And that they can walk, because sometimes they come into the space, but even when they're in the space, they don't feel like they belong in the space. Mm -hmm. That community right. music schools are important. Community programs are important. And as you were saying, Felicia, it's not just about crotchets, right? It's about self-esteem, dignity. Yeah. And the responsibility is maybe not so much on communities, but maybe the responsibility is on institutions to do something with what they have. Mm -hmm. right to go into the community and to have spaces um, any closing I, remarks from your side or sharing also with us what are you doing at the moment you know it's good to see you here because a lot of people have been through so much over covid at the moment um <coughs> we are preparing for our next jazz concert and we're partnering with Stingland high school uh, there's a music project there music lane that we also partner with and so some of the students are going to play at the concert. And then um, we're planning to go down to George um, with the help of the Social Impact Division at Stellenbosch University. Um, we've been doing a few visits to establish um, a satellite program, certificate program in George Oatswoden areas because the university is in partnership with that municipality. So we're planning to take some of Ramon's jazz students with the um, ensemble down and go and do some concerts and workshops with the music students at George High and Oatswoden to 
just go around and say, look, this is what we do at Stellenbosch. Um, this is what you can do if you like jazz. You know, you, this is what you need to do to get ready. And, and it's also for us, for, for us, you know, there's, there's a generation um, that went by without being aware of the, the impact and the influence of, of the Cape Jazz um, collective that Ramon is part of. And I think though that knowledge needs to come into our work that we do um, at the, into our teaching as well. So that's why I'm very glad that we have Ramon with that behind him and that knowledge that he brings with him um, to our students. And I think that's where community, this bridge between the institution and communities becomes really important because the community has something to teach the institution. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. I always quote this uh, philosopher, Yin. He said, um, who said the center of the lake is where the important things happen? Because what if you throw a stone into, into a lake and you watch the ripples come out? The ripples always go out to the edges, right? And so what if what is happening on the edges isn't as important as what is happening in the center? Oh, yeah. That's powerful. Exactly. That's a good note. And I think that's a great that's a great way to end this conversation. It's perfect. Yeah. I'm not even going to spoil <laughs> it by trying to be deeper than that, because that is exactly what it is. And thank that you is very true. much. Thank you so much. Thank it's you. been wonderful meeting you and chatting to you. Thank you. We enjoyed this really. <laughs>